Father, this time as we speak about being a Christian in a fake world, bless us. And Lord, um, help us to ask the right questions. We love our children and we, don't want them, we do not want them to be lost. We want them to be saved. Use us so all these things may happen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question for you. Are we, as Christians, minorities or the majority? Okay, so this is why I'm teaching this class. Because we are not the minority. We are the vast majority. You see, keeping it real means also telling the kids the truth. Now let me explain what I mean. Out of all the planets that God created, which is the only planet that's in? So this planet, in comparison to all the other planets, is this planet the minority or the majority? The minority, am I right? And as a Christian on this planet, when I accept Jesus, I've now become part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, which is the majority. Am I a minority or majority? You see what I'm saying? And the devil, Satan, wants us to believe that we are the minority. But we're not. We're the vast majority. See what I'm saying? So once you change that mental mindset, then all of a sudden you realize that what Jesus was saying, I'm living the real life, and everyone else is living a fake life. Now I want you to think about this. If the world was really living a real life, why then the drug culture? Why do they want to escape from drinking? Why do they want to do all these other things? Answer the question. Does anyone know why? They want to escape. Escape from the real world? Or is this they're escaping from they know that it's a fake world? Because you see, there is no joy in a fake world. Because only true joy comes from God. So you hear what I'm saying? So let me ask you a question. Then what is the real world? Isn't it the Christian world? Are we the minority or are we the majority? Does that make sense? So we're here to show people the truth. And part of the truth is that in Christ, you will find the real life. Amen? So we're going to go to the first principle, and I'm going to be going through these real quickly. And I, you have your little cheat sheets with you. And with all of them, I have a little story. Because I want you to think about these things. Because you see, these seven points have helped me Wherever I worked at, local churches, conference, to help our young people realize that God is real. Okay, now, as leaders, we need to have a philosophy. And from that philosophy is how we do our ministry. Does that make sense? And this is my philosophy that I'm sharing with you. So the first thing, everything that I do, the foundation, just like a construction builder, what do you build first? Do you build the roof first or do you build the foundation first? Which one is it? The foundation, right? So guess what? In this philosophy, what should always be the first foundation? Here it is. To help our young people accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Without Christ in their lives, we have no foundation from which to build on. Am I correct? In other words, we are replugging them. Let me explain it this way. Years ago, when I was in engineering, one of the teachers shared this true story. At the air traffic control tower, the main system wasn't working, so they had the backup system working. Now imagine if you're on an airplane and you find out that the main system is not working and your plane is landing. How would that make you feel as a passenger? So they call all the engineers, they take out all the schematics, and they're trying to figure out what's wrong with the main system. Hours go by, and then somebody else comes in and says, you guys forgot the most simple solution. What is it? Getting back to the basics. My friends, guess what, you find, guess what you think happened? Coffee cup fell, hit the plug, knocked it off. Now, was that pretty simple? So guess what he did? He moved the cup over, plugged it in, system is working. Because why he went back to the foundation? No electricity, it doesn't work. Does that make sense? So the first thing is this. Think about it. When we plug the, our young people to Christ, what's going to happen? They're going to grow. 
Now, here's the problem that I want to share with you. As a church, a lot of times we forget that kids are people too. Now, how do young people find Christ? You think, you know, they just find it. Oh, here's a pair of glasses. I put it on. I have Jesus Christ. Wow. I don't know whose glasses those are. Are those yours, brother? Okay. And you're reading without them? Oh, okay, all right, okay. I was like, boy, you must have the gift. <laughs> so this is what happens. Sometimes we forget that kids are people. So the first thing is we need to have activities at least once a month, social activities, for the kids just to come. Now, how do you think I came to the church, folks? You think I came through a prophecy seminar? No. Bible studies? No. I got invited to play baseball. Okay? Social events. So when I came to play baseball, guess why also I came? Was to check out the girls. Okay? I'm going to be honest. I came to play softball and to check out the chicas. Now I have a question. Is there anything wrong with that? Now if you're an Adventist and you see this ghetto kid coming over to check out the girls, I know what you're going to say. Right? Beware. Build up the walls. <laughs> but me coming in, I'm not, I don't see it that way. It's like, mamma mia, mamma mia. <laughs> So this is what happened. The kids start coming in to what they like. Does that make sense? And then what happens is as they keep coming, they notice that you pray before you start. They notice cursing is not allowed. See what I'm saying? So the second level is they're willing to tolerate the spiritual things, but they keep coming. Now I have a question for you. Isn't it better that our young people keep coming to our church, even though they may have their issues? But they're coming. Why? The Holy Spirit is bringing them in. But a lot of times, like I said this morning, the guy with the long hair, I don't know how many times people have stopped, people like Chad at the door, you need to cut your hair. You need to change your clothes. And we put requirements. My friends, just let them come. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. And then finally, the third level, what happens is they start taking initiative for their own spiritual growth. And I remember that happened to me. When all of a sudden, I want to come and I want to listen to the sermons, and you know where I started sitting at, right? Right in the front. You notice a lot of the teenagers, they hang out in the back. But when we go to baseball games, where we want to sit? The box office seats. And for me, my mindset was the box office seats were in the front. So guess where I wanted to sit? Right in the front. And then later on, the pastor made it mandatory. All the youth sit in the front, so everybody got upset at me. But then afterwards, this is what happens. They're willing to help other people to grow. And this little ghetto kid, that's what I started doing. Once Jesus was my foundation, hey, dude, you can't curse over here. Hey, dude, you can't be looking at that girl that way. Guess who took the initiative? I did. Because guess what God is doing in my life? Does that make sense? Then the next thing is the multiplier level. All of a sudden, they want to be part of the leadership team. And that's what happened to me. And I finally became a Pathfinder Associate Director, then a Director. Does that make sense? So the first thing is this. Everything that we do is to help our young people find Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That should be part of the whole plan. But in the beginning, they just come. Does that make sense? Principle number two, or philosophy number two. To help, and for those that want the Bible text, it's over here. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, 21. That God has called us to help other people be reconciled on his behalf. Okay, so I'm moving forward because I, I do want to finish on time. Normally I have 90 minutes to do this, but I know this is only an hour. Okay, the second one is to help mold the character of our young people as the Holy Spirit directs us. We are to be involved in the shaping of the lives of those God gives us to disciple. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. Kid comes to your path on the club, and he's cursing. Should you say amen? He says, no, I do. You know why? My brother's looking at me like, you must be weird. Let me back up and I'll give you the full story. We had a basketball tournament. We wanted people to come. And in this basketball tournament, we had young people that were not Adventists yet. Notice, yet? And in the tournament, we got to the finals. Two teams made it to the finals. And right there, just before the buzzer, you know, the final buzzer, close to the end of the game, not quite yet, one kid turns around, shoots, he hits the other guy in the face. It was a pure accident. 
The other guy gets hit in the face. He has nothing. He just he doesn't think about it because that's basketball. But then the other friend said, you're going to let him hit you like that? So guess who instigated the whole thing? You're going to let that guy just walk around you like that? So the other guy turns around and says, why did you hit me? It was an accident, man. He goes, well, I don't like that. And he pushed him. The other guy says, look, it was an accident. He pushed him back. And a fight broke out right there. Now, some of you are like, this is why we don't play sports. <laughs> I get called in, and I'm like, amen. You're like, what? It's a teaching moment. See, part of molding character is when bad things happen, we show them how to do it better. Amen? amen. A week later, we hold the tournament again because we had to stop it. And before we start, the Adventist guy, he comes up and the microphone says, I need to apologize to everyone. First, I shame God by my behavior. Second, my mom is the leader for this event, and I shamed our family. I'm asking you to forgive me. And then he turned around and he says, and I'm asking you to forgive me for my behavior. To the guy, he took the high road, started the fight. The guy says, no, I need to apologize. I was wrong. And guess what happened? They hug. You know, they start shaking and they hug. And I don't know why, but when one person starts crying, what guess what starts happening? <laughs> yeah, one of the girls goes, so sweet. <laughs> we had a crying moment. <laughs> now I have a question for you. Was that a molding moment? And a lot of times when the opportunities happen, we want to throw them out, we want to get rid of them, instead of saying, thank you, Lord, because here's an opportunity to help this gig grow in Christ. Amen? So this is the philosophy point number two. First one is help them get established with Christ. Second one is be open to the molding of their character as we get them ready for heaven. And then the text here. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go. So when he is young, is that what it says there? It says when he is old, he will not turn from it. 1 Timothy 4, 11 and 12. Command and teach these things. And this is what we are to teach our young people. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example. This is what this young man did. For believers in speech and life and love and faith and what else? So part of a philosophy, the second one, is how do we teach our kids to live in a real world? Is to help be part of the molding character. But this is what happens, my friends. We act like if someone curses, if someone messes up, or something does someone does something wrong, that that's not living a real life. I have a question. Are we imperfect? Are we imperfect? Who's the only one that makes us perfect? And in, in that perfection, we will mess up. And sometimes we act to the young people that we're so holy that we don't mess up. So guess who's then living a fake life? We are. Am I right? But when we open and honest, I will mess up as your leader. I may do things or say things that sometimes will get you upset. But guess what? God is working in me like he's working in you. Amen? That's living a real life. Not living the fake life. Does that make sense? Sister, you're looking at me like, okay. The next two go together, but I separated them for the ease. As Adventist Church, we are so good at this. This is why you're here. Let me read this, which is actually point number five, but we do this with our kids. To train our young people for service and mission. We train and train and train, right? Discipleship includes the sharing of our transformed lives with those who do not know the Savior of the world. We're good with this. Now, here's the problem. And this is why this has to go with the next one. Okay, let me read Ephesians 4. To prepare God's people, this is our part, for works of service, and we're going to read this later on, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go to this point over here. We're good with the training, but then we're awful in this point. And I'm going to break it down by ages. So let me read this, and then I'm going to pause and give a quick story. Actually, two of them. Point number four, to provide opportunities for our young people for mission and service. Notice, it's not to train them, it's to provide opportunities. In many situations, we train our young people without giving opportunities where they may invest their time, energy, and heart into a cause using their God-given gifts and talents. 
So let me pause over here. When are we going to trust our kids to do mission work? Let me explain. Let's put over here a 16-year-old. Let's put over your 18-year-old. So when a kid is 16, are they responsible yet? Some of you say no. But if you go to Latin America, how many of them are directors at 16? Okay, 18. Well, at 18, they could fight a war, but they can't drink till they're 21. Think about that. Is it 21? But they could vote now, right? But they can't have their own car insurance, you know, when you go rent the car until they're what, 25? So that's when they're really a young adult. So between 16 and 25, what's the age discrepancy? Nine years. Am I right? Nine years. When is the age category that we see most of our young people leaving our church? Two. Two. 25. And why is that? We don't trust them. We don't give them opportunities. Think about this. So let me explain two stories with you, and I want to share about my philosophy in doing this. The first one, his name is Robert, Roberto. Young guy, below 16. When I first met him, they used to call him Chubbs. Okay? So I says, Robert, do you like the way you are? He goes, nope. I said, I'm going to help you. We're going to go bike riding together. So the first time he got on the bike, because you see, we have to train them and then find opportunities for them, right? So part of the training is, guess what? It's also my health. So I'm helping him with the bike. And at first, he was so slow. I remember the first time we did a push-up. He couldn't do a regular push-up. He had to do a wall push-up. You know what a wall push-up is? On the wall. <laughs> he could not do a regular push-up. After three or four months, I remember the first push-up he did. He was shaking. OK? So we did knee push-ups. <laughs> and then finally, he did a regular men's push-up. Knees off the ground, right? After six to eight to nine months, guess what happened? With the training that we did, the girl started saying, hmm, because he was a handsome guy, but now he also had the physique. And so guess who became our physical fitness instructor for the club? <laughs> so I trained them, and I gave him what? The opportunity. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Do you think he loved it? Absolutely. And I thought I was easy on him. He was hard. <laughs> but the kids loved him. A young guy, physical fitness instructor for our 44 kids, amen? Let me show you something else now. In the summer, I run three programs. Actually, four. We run three different summer camps, and we run a missions camp. I am the executive director. Guess who actually runs a summer camp program? Young lady, she works here by the college. Her name is Lindsay. She's the administrative, uh, one of the assistants there. She drives up every summer. She is a summer camp director. Not me. She's in her early 20s. So when I asked her to be the summer camp director, she's like, me? Now I have a question. What age category does she fall in? 16 to 25. And this is the age where we start losing a lot of young people. Why? We train them, train them, train them, but then we never unleash them. You know what I'm saying, church? And so how can a young person feel that their Christianity is real when we don't give them the opportunity or trust them? Does that make sense? But when we give them the opportunities and they experience the wonders of it, guess what happens? It's real. It's not fake. So I did something crazy, and I don't want you guys to get upset at me. Under the old college president, I ordained Lindsay as an elder. So guess who was doing all the baptisms at the camp? Because I wasn't there. I was floating between all the camps. So this young, early 20s is doing the baptisms. How do you think she felt? This year, she got all theology students from Southern. We have six of them. And as they're doing all the Bible studies, these young theology students, they don't even have their degrees yet. And the kids are saying, I want them to baptize us. So she calls me up. She says, Carl, what should I do? 
It says, be in the pool with them for support. I'm sorry. I moved it. Forgive me. You should have seen the look like, man, I see my mojo. <laughs> so Lindsay gives me a call. And I says, absolutely. So guess what happens? These young theology students were making it real. As they're baptizing their kids, one of them was a, a staff member. You should have seen the glow in their eyes. I have a question. Is the church real to them? Do we trust them? So a lot of times we're willing to give our young people titles, but not the authority to make the decisions. You hear what I'm saying? I see this big smile on your face. What's your name? Diana. Diana? Do you agree with that? You're like, mm, preach your brother, right? <laughs> I started at a young age as a director. My pastor trusted me. So for me, Christianity was real. He didn't put me in that box that we do here in America. That after you're 25 and you have a college degree <laughs> and you have maturity, then you can help lead out in the church. Hear what I'm saying? Do we have any questions at this point before I go on to the last three? Any questions? Should I go on? Okay, you're like, okay. Matthew 28. Then Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This command, is it only for those over the age of 25 or is it for everyone? Let's go to the fifth one. This is what you hear. To train our leaders for effectiveness, empowerment, and spiritual development. Our young people need the best leaders, and we strive to give the best to our young people. I want to pause over here, because when I was a pastor, I follow what Moses did, which Moses delegated. Remember this? I'm not going to read all this, but I want to read this over here from Ellen White, Gospel Workers. And then remind me about the nominating committees, okay? The youth need more than a casual notice, more than an occasional word of encouragement. They need pain, staking, prayerful, careful labor. He only whose heart is filled with love and sympathy, this is you, the leaders, will be able to reach those youth who are apparently careless and indifferent. Not all can be helped in the same way. We need leaders who knows how to work with kids, Amen. And then let me read this one over here. God deals with each, talk about the youth, according to his temperament and character. And we must cooperate with him. Often those whom we pass by with indifference because we judge them from outward appearance, having them the best material for workers. And we'll repay all the efforts bestowed on them. There must be more study given to the problem of how to deal with the youth. More earnest prayer for wisdom that is needed in dealing with minds. Now let me pause over here. When I was a pastor, before I abolished the nominating committee, because <gasps> we did a gift-based. Instead of, you see, the nominated committee doesn't give you your gift. It is God. And we're going to see this in the message. But before we did that, you, you notice in most nominated committees, who did they vote first? The elders and what else? The deacons and the treasurers, right? And I says, no, we're going to vote first the Sabbath school leaders for children, then for kids, adventure leaders, and pathfinders. And until that's done, we're not going to move forward. So this went on for weeks. And they go, Carl, why are we doing this? Because the kids always get, many times, the scraps. Think about what I'm saying. I said, how come we can't give the young people the best? That was one of the reasons why we called Deanna to come when I was down there in Boynton Beach <laughs> as one of our teachers for our school. She's like, oh, no. And then once we got all these things first, then we nominated the rest. Does that make sense? Now, why do then in our church we treat the kids like last? And I got a question for you. When we put the kids first, we give them good Sabbath school programs. Are those kids going to attract other kids? Yes or no? 
Are those kids going to bring their parents to church? Yes or no? Yes. Is a church age group going to get younger? Yes or no? Are those parents going to see that a church is being real for their needs? But what do we care about? All we care is about evangelism. Thank you. I agree with you. That is evangelism. But you know what I'm referring to. So part of my philosophy is very simple. We need to have leaders that love working with kids. Because sometimes, in the end, we just choose the nominated committee leaders to fill a position, and they don't enjoy working with kids. And how do you think the kids feel? Do they feel loved? Do they feel appreciated? And they know who the fake leaders are, right? So let me give you one quick story. I was asked to be a director. This is when I was in Atlantic Union College. I did it for my last year. So I'm a student, theology student, and I'm asked to be the director. So that says, Carl, you're going to do it. Yes, sir, pastor. Because <laughs> that's my calling. Girl walks in. When I say walked in, she was decked. Now, you know what I mean? Ruby lipsticks. Earrings. Necklaces. Short skirt. Now, I have a question. If you're a director, you don't love kids, what's the first thing you think you will do? What was that? Not only start judging, what will you do? Make it an issue, right? Welcome. Remember, come level, come as you are. But God will then change you. But come, welcome. Weeks go by, she notices that the other girls are not wearing the stuff. So guess what happens? Her lipstick gets less. Her earrings got real short to studs. Her dresses got longer, so you're laughing, right? Because now you have positive peer pressure. Kids ministering to other kids. The mom starts coming to church. Two or three weeks later, as I'm walking out of church, and I was hungry, so I wanted to go home real quick, because there was no Pollock that day. So my stomach was doing the Watusi dance. You ever had that feeling? You're like, miss, you don't eat breakfast fully. You're listening to the sermon, but your stomach is doing the And so I'm like, I want to get out of here, go home, eat some of my wife's good arroz con frijoles, eat some beans. And she says, Carl, I need to stop. I mean, I need to talk to you. And guess how she's dressed? Same way with the daughter was dressed when I first met her. Ruby lips. Now, some of you are laughing. Never judged her. Welcome. She goes, I need to talk to you. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Okay, this must be serious. She says, I want to thank you. Okay for stopping and saying hello in my mind. That's my HDHD, you know, those Ds kicking in. She goes, no, no, I want to thank you for the way you treated my daughter. Okay, what do you mean? You never asked her once to take the jewelry off. You never once made it an issue. She did it all on her own. Thank you. You allowed God to make the changes. There must be more study given to the problem of how to deal with youth, more earnest prayer for wisdom that is needed in dealing with minds. And here's my answer for the leaders. Do you pray for your kids every day? You have a checklist? So I'm giving you a clue here. How do you pray for these kids that you want God to change them? Every day by name, pray for them. Pray for your staff every day. Allow God to do the miracles. Does that make sense? So the last two points are a little controversial, but other than these philosophy points didn't come from me, they came from Ellen White, which I'm not ashamed of. Okay, we're going to leave recreation for last, but I want to touch this one first. We need to teach our young people our heritage, our purpose, our history, our future. It says teach our young people our Adventist heritage. This includes the history, teachings, and the prophetic call as our church. Why is this important, folks? Remember Deuteronomy? Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. In other words, this is what I was told to old his, um, Israel. Teach them to your children, talking about them.
when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And it's funny because when I lived in New York, we would see these little things on the side of the houses. You know what those were, right? You would touch it. Okay? So your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. As many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. So before we get to this last point, let me ask you a question. Honestly, how many of our kids understand why they're Adventists? How many of our kids understand where to find the proofs of their beliefs in Scripture? Now I want to hit you hard. How many of you could do the same? So in other words, we have been called as a church to make real God's kingdom to these young people. And if we don't know the scriptures, how can we do it? You see what I'm saying? If we don't have the experience of Jesus living us, can it be easy for us to show these kids that God is real? And so part of our heritage is learning where we came from, but also where we're going, which is heaven. Do we teach our kids these things? So let me tell you one of the things that we're doing. <coughs> We have a TLT program that you guys are starting over here. And every TLT weekend, we have a weekend just for them. And a lot of times, I'm the one that they ask to come to speak. And they come and they, with a specific topic. And guess what the issue is to talk about the whole weekend is that topic. So when they talk about premarital sex, guess what we talk about? Sex. When they want to talk about why we believe in the Sabbath, guess what I talk about? Sabbath. When they want to talk about why... Certain, you know, there was a whole issue about worship and music. Guess what I talk about? Worship and music. Because why? They have questions. They want to understand why we believe these things and why they mean a lot to us. Does that make sense? But this is part of our heritage, our teachings, our beliefs. And if we can't make it real to them, it's not going to fly. Let me give you an example. You ready? Some of you have probably noticed that I wear what? And some people think, I just want to make sure of the time. When do we finish here? I just want to make sure. Okay, good. We're on time. Because I want to give time for questions. So many people think, because I wear a wedding band, that I'm a progressive. Or well, I'm a liberal. Am I correct? In the Spanish churches, right? Ooh, pastor, an Asian, pastor with a ring. Woohoo! One step before Babylon, right? But nobody ever asked me why I wear a wedding band. And I have a question. Part of our Christian heritage, isn't it one man, one wife? Part of our Christian heritage, isn't marriage part of that? Who ordained marriage? So we live in a society that doesn't promote God. So guess why I wear the band? Because guess what I want to promote? I want to promote our part of our Christian heritage. That it is God that ordained marriage. It is him that does it. Now here's the other thing about keeping it real. Keeping it real. Now here I am, I'm way over 50, I'm, I'm an old fart. Okay? And my friends don't believe me, this is, we don't understand why, Pastor, you have to wear a wedding band. And I was just talking to my friend about that one issue. We're in the airport. Now you know in the airport what happens is sometimes you have areas where there's nobody sitting because that plane is not coming in for a while. So sometimes I go to those areas. You know why? More privacy. We could talk, right? More relaxed. We could put our feet up. So here we are. We're talking in one of those areas. And out of nowhere, one lady, the other lady goes to the restroom first. She comes, and out of all the places to sit, so here I am. I'm over here. My friend Caesar's over here. Out of all places to sit, the whole place is empty. Guess where she decides to sit? She goes, is it okay if I sit over here? Now, she didn't see that I had a wedding band yet. Why? Because my body was turned. Okay? So she sat down, so she still doesn't see it. She goes, oh, um, you have a nice aura about you. Your voice carries. And so we wanted to, my friend and I, we're going to just want to sit next to you. Now, some of you are laughing. 
And I'm thinking, okay, this old fart, can I say that? Okay, all right, because, you know, sometimes in the South, some words that we think are acceptable in the North, they're not acceptable in the South. Am I right, sister? Okay. And so she sits right there. My friend goes, I cannot believe this is happening. We just talked about this. So she sits there. Her friend comes by, and they want to talk to us because we have a nice aura. And for some reason, some people like Latin men. I don't know why. They must think we're Ricky Martin somehow. Because <laughs> they were not young. They're, you know, these women, was, one was closer to my age, the other one was closer to his age. And then when I turn around, she sees the wedding. She goes, I apologize. I did not know you was married. I says, I am, and happily. Is it okay we then sit over here? She was embarrassed. Now I have a question. Did I say anything? or that I promote the institution of what I believe. Now some of you are like, well, you know, you don't need a ring to prove it. Well, for her, she needed it. Teach our young people the principles, we gotta get to this, sorry, the one before that, our heritage, what we believe. So before I go to the last one, I have a question. How do you teach the kids about Sabbath? That Sabbath could be fun. Because I want to link this with the last one. See, part of our heritage, is the Sabbath part of it, yes or no? Yes. All right. So how do we make it real in a fake world? So let's go to the last one over here. It says, teach the young people the principles of recreation. And I'm going to be bringing these two points together about a heritage and recreation. All can be lost if we do not teach the young people to discern. Notice the word I'm using here. To discern what are the negative influence in their lives. And one of them is this, like it or not. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good what? I want to read this last, but I want to share one quick story. We had a Pathfinder director. My name for him was Mr. Killjoy. He knew how to kill joy. But he lived in a fake world. Okay? So we have this campery. This was when I was in New Jersey. Five or six hundred kids are there for, the, you know, for you know, smaller conferences. We design all these activities for the day for them. Hiking, honors, a bunch of activities. One club didn't come. All the kids are wearing their jeans and shorts. Why? Because they're going to what? The activities. They're having fun on Sabbath, right? We want it to be a delight. We want to make it real that Sabbath keeping could be fun. But Mr. Kiljoy, I won't tell his name because in case anybody gives him a call. <laughs> but Mr. Killjoy had all the pathfinders stay in uniform, in a circle, open the Bible, and that's all they could do. Because it was not proper to have the lights on the Sabbath. So I started praying for him, Lord, may lightning strike him, but not dead. <laughs> Lord, may the sun really heat up on his head. To his, to his hair turns gray. I mean, you know, I have these crazy prayers because I was upset because you see these kids looking at everyone else not paying attention to them. So I prayed, Lord, por favore, please, please, like a squeeze. Weirdest thing happened. Pathfinders, get up. Get out of the uniforms. They couldn't believe it. What? Sir? What's going on? Get out of the uniforms. You guys want to join everybody else? Do you got to say it twice? <laughs> Those kids were back in their shorts. Or... <laughs> Happy? What can we do? Here's a list. Go have fun. They did. Those kids, Christianity became real. Because now recreation was merged with our tradition, the correct tradition. You hear what I'm saying? And what happens a lot of times in our heritage, we get to a point that we think being different is sinful. 
You know what I'm saying? Being different is sinful. Instead of being different is just what? Different. When I lived in Mexico, <laughs> you know over there they don't do hikes, right? So we're over there on Sabbath with our shorts. My wife in shorts, me in shorts. So she's already shaking her head, oh no. But the pastors could get in a circle and hit a soccer ball, right? Because football is religion number two down there. <laughs> right? <laughs> but us taking a hat, Sabbath hike, so when the ladies stopped us, they go, no, 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 no puede ser eso. You can't do this. Why? <clears throat> we went home. We changed. <laughs> we didn't hike. Now Why? Because we didn't want them to sin. Was it wrong for us to hike? Was being different sinful? But we did it out of respect for their tradition because I'm in their country. Understand what I'm saying? I became all things to all people. And sometimes we forget that our traditions sometimes are not God's traditions. They're not even biblical. <laughs> Show me in the scripture where I can't hike. <laughs> Am I correct? And so sometimes we make Christianity fake to our young people by the way we choose to practice our faith. That's not biblical. Let me explain one thing. I see my brother like, ooh. Am I right? And then we'll close. And I do want to, in case anybody has any questions. I love to pray. I'm a praying person. So that's why people say, Carl, you pray for everything. I says, yeah, I do. I have a question in Scripture. When Paul and Peter talk about praying, how do they say we should pray? In the true, the, the, the true Jewish tradition, how does one pray? Where does God live? In heaven. So who do you look to when you pray? You look up. And as you pray, you also raise your hands. Now, if I start praying like this in the Adventist church, even though that's scripture in the New Testament, people get to think of what? Pentecostal, right? Pentecostal, right? But how come I don't do it in front of you? I am right now, but you know what I mean. Every time I come over here and pray, because why? Instead of building a bridge, I'm building a barrier, right? So there's a lot of things that I'm different with that I don't do, not because it's sinful. It's not. Praying out is that sinful? But I don't do. Why? Because I have to respect the Columbia, sorry, Georgia Cumberland traditions. Does that make sense? But does it mean that it's sinful? doesn't mean that it's wrong. And so young people, they see that. How in the world could this be wrong when you can't even show it scripturally? And when we try to make arguments, we present a fake Christianity to them. And then we wonder why sometimes they want to leave the church. Because they see us as hypocrites that we're not following scripture. Does that make sense? So let's go over all these things again. How do we help our young people realize that Christianity is real? Number one. Jesus needs to be the foundation. We live in the majority in Christ. Amen? Number two, we're here to mold their character. So when they mess up, let's see it as opportunities to help them to grow. Instead of reprimanding them, pointing the fingers, you know better as a Christian. My daughter, once she was so angry at this man, during one of these camperies that she actually cursed. Never heard my daughter curse, ever. So the director from the other club comes and says, your daughter cursed. And I go, nah. Elizabeth, did you curse? I did that. <laughs> so is that an opportunity? So Elizabeth, what caused you to curse? And she said, I said, okay, so now you know. When you start getting angry, take a breath. <laughs> you may think it, but then later on, you stop thinking it. You do it in stages. Opportunity, molding their character. The third one, God wants us to train our young people, build an army for them. But that goes with the next part. We, we could train all day long, but if we don't give them the opportunities to use the gifts that God has given them, then why are we training them? Does that make sense? Put them to work. Okay, so our program with our TLTs, every time we do adventure weekends, we have about three, 350 week, you know, kids. Guess who's in charge of all the Sunday activities? The TLTs. Remember that? Guess who helps lead out teaching the awards or the associate leaders? The young people. 
The more we give them the opportunities to use their gifts, the more real is their Christian experience. Does that make sense? Then the next one, number five, is to help our leaders learn how to work with kids. Now, I've got to be honest. If there's leaders in your churches and your teams, and they don't want God to mold them, they don't want to be patient, all they want to be is judgmental or critical, ask them to step down. Our kids don't need those type of leaders. They get it enough from other places. Does that make sense? God wants leaders that will love the kids with all their mess-ups. Have you ever had what a path on the come in one of those type of haircuts? You know what I'm talking about? They come to your church, punk style, black, black lipstick. How will you treat them? As part of a leader, welcome. Allow God to change them. Let us be part of that process. And then the last two, they go together is the recreation and our teachings. So how do we help our young people realize that our teachings are real? Is when we allow the differences and the things that are not scripture don't make it an issue. Hear what I'm saying? If it's not scriptural, don't make it an issue. But we have Adventist people that will die for tradition that's not scriptural. So when a tradition is real, then when the recreation comes, it's also real. So let me read this text and then I'll close. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about what? These things. I do want to share, I don't know why, but the Lord is impressing me to share one quick story. TLT weekend, I took the kids bowling. Bad choice on my part, I made a mistake. Not that we went bowling, the location we went to. The music that they had was horrible. So afterwards, I got the kids together. There was about 25 kids, 30 TLTs. And because they, this is their way for me to say thank you for serving. So I take them water skiing on Sunday and we can do some a Saturday night activity. Next time I'm gonna take them roller skating because they control the music for us. I apologize to all those kids. Now, how do you think I, they treated me afterwards? I kept it real, right? I said, look, some of the songs were great. Beautiful. Now, you ever seen those um, songs about move it to the left, move it to the right? You, you know which one I'm talking about? So all the TLTs were actually doing it together. Okay? I said, if my wife was here, she would have been joining you. But the other music about sex and lust, a lot of the kids were going like this. I says, guys, we, we, got, we got a clothes shop here. <laughs> so we left early. I messed up. I'm not going to go there again. <laughs> do I make mistakes as a leader? The kids, when they see that I'm real about it, guess what they do? Then the faith is also real. Does that make sense? OK, do we have any questions? Any, don't be afraid. I don't bite, just bark. Bless you. Is that a question or a blessing? <laughs> yes. Right. How do I get the leaders? And sometimes there's people leading. Boy, you have to open up with one of the most touchy subjects, right? <laughs> okay, sometimes the, the directors or the leaders, they're afraid to say it, so they, they call me. So I went to one church, and this is what I'm talking about. We, have a, we had an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, who for some reason... Her hormones was ahead of schedule. So she became well endowed at that age. But she was still dressing like an 11 year old. So in other words, not wearing the proper top structure to hold what needs to be held together. Okay, with a very light shirt that you can see everything. And super, super bikini. I mean, not bikinis, but um, skirts. 
So the church wants to put her in discipline because this is the leader now. Okay, so I go to the board member, to the board, and I bring a, a, a bag of stones. And I put the bag in the middle. I ask if we could sit in a circle. And I step in the middle, and I give each one a stone. I says, okay, guys, ready? And I count of three, throw it at me. They go, you're crazy. I says, this is what you used it to the girl. I said, I have a question. Did any of the female staff talk to the girl about she dresses? No. Did anybody talk to the parents at all about this subject? So you didn't talk to the girl, you didn't talk to the parents, and none of the staff was willing to take the initiative to talk to her. So I said, board, here's a problem. The girl doesn't know that she's making other people lust after her. But you guys, because you can't control your lust, instead of dealing with this correctly, you want to remove her. That was a little harsh on my part, I know. But it worked. <laughs> And I said, so you see, part of the problem is not what she's doing. I agree. She needs to be talked to. Part of the problem is how we're handling the situation. And this leader constantly, this is the way he handles the situation. You chose this leader. I think you need to rethink who you're going to put here. Someone that's going to love this girl and help her to grow. Okay? Thank God that she's in the church. My mom came and talked to me and said, thank you. I just gave you one example. Is that okay or should I go on? Okay. Any other questions? So I'm surprised um, you guys haven't raised your hand yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Give us your first name again. Rohan. Rohan? Okay, training of young people. Okay. Okay, well, let me, let me do two things. In the church service, they could actually read, right? They could read. Can they also preach? Can they lead out in music? Can they be the leader of tithing offerings? See, the, it doesn't just have to be church. But here's the other thing also. When my daughter was younger, the age of four, she could already do math and, and arithmetic. She came out like me, a geek. And so whatever, every time I would read the Bible, guess what I would do? I would sit her down, I had a picture Bible for her, and I would read the Bible. So by the time that she was six, guess what she was doing on her own? On her own, she was reading the Bible. Okay, so one of the ways to make Christianity real is when the kids, especially in their home and then in the clubs, when they see us doing what we want them to do. See, a lot of times because we're not living their life, and then we want them to live their life, it doesn't match. So here's your question. It could be both, right? Let's live it. And now can the kids also be active in the church? Yes, but here's the problem. Sometimes the church doesn't want that. So guess where I want to encourage you? Do a children's church when they run everything. Because then there's no complaints. Okay, so if your church could do it once a month or twice a month, children's church, let them run it all. Okay, one of the churches where I, I was not the pastor, but I was the youth leader. Once a month, guess what, which was the biggest attendance service. We had kids from other churches coming because they ran it all. Ten-year-olds preaching. Twelve-year-olds teaching Sabbath school. Pretty awesome, right? They did it all. Can it be done? The answer is yes. But sometimes we don't allow for that. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Your name? Nicola? Okay, Mrs. Nicola, go ahead. Do you have any uh, resources or suggestions? Yes, some of the resources, he forgot to give them to me yesterday. Um, Source has them. Okay, so you see the handsome guy in the corner, in the, not that he wants to hide in the dark. Okay, he has some resources, okay? Uh, do you have any today? Specifically how to work with kids, with the youth. Yep, he does, he bought them. Okay, Nicola, any other questions? Before we close, okay. Hopefully, I've not been too controversial because that's not my intent. Can I see my brother smiling here? My goal is to encourage you to think 
how we could be better leaders. And it all comes down for one thing. What is my philosophy for our young people? I just share this. What is yours? And my goal is this, that you could rethink or think about what is your philosophy. But the main, main point is you have to love the kids. And if you don't love the kids, it's going to show. And if you want to learn to love the kids, because remember, I, one time I used to hate working with kids. It's hard to believe, right? You could ask God to bless you with that. And I'll be sharing that testimony at another time. Okay, any other questions? If not, we'll close. Okay, let's have a prayer. Father, thank you again that you are a real God. <laughs> and when we join your kingdom, we're part of the majority. Lord, the world wants to show or make us believe that Christianity is unreal. It's fake. When the truth is, is the other way around, you are the joy of our lives. You are the God that gives us satisfaction and hope for the present and the future. And you're the one that fulfills our dreams and the desires that you put in our hearts. So Lord, help us. Mold us. Let us be the best. Not only for these kids, but also to honor you. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.